Hello, my name is John Finn, and it is so great to be here again with the TV7 family. I have a heart for everyone here, and it's such a privilege to come to you. I've taught several series before, and this series is on how to live in the balance of grace and faith. I'm going to talk about the grace of God, and perhaps not like you've ever heard it before, because it's talking about being empowered by the Holy Spirit to live for Christ. There's a lot of teaching out there about grace that is actually in error. And some people t twist uh, otherwise good teaching about grace and turn it into a license for sin. They say things like, there is no such thing as needing to ask forgiveness. There is no accountability. We can live however we'd like. And I want to share with you today what the Bible says. But to do that, I also need to share about the law and legalism and false religion so that we can compare the two and that we can know what true grace is and true faith. Now, this starts because years ago when I was seeking the Lord, he spoke to me because I wanted a definition of grace. I wanted something more clear than what the standard teaching of grace is. I think we've all probably heard about grace being the unmerited or the unearned favor of God. And that's good as far as it goes, but when I was reading scripture, I could see other meanings to grace. For instance, Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1, be strong in the grace that is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I thought, how can you be strong in favor? Why was he telling him to be strong in grace? And then he was telling Timothy how to live in power with the Lord, how to, to walk in the things which the Lord has provided. And that started me studying the Word of God. And so the first scripture I want to show with you is in John chapter 1, in verse 17, that says, The law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Now we're going to look at the law first. We're going to look at religion versus grace. And know that Moses brought the law. Moses brought the rules and regulations. But grace and truth came by Jesus. And what we're going to see is that grace and truth are always united. There are other things always connected with grace as well. And that includes faith. So we will look at some of those. For instance, Cain is really the father of all false religions. And without going into to detail, you can turn to Genesis uh, yourself in chapter 3 and such and see the story in chapter 4 of Cain and Abel. And you'll recall how Cain made a sacrifice of the vegetables he had grown from the ground, whereas Abel made a sacrifice of the animals, the livestock, the sheep. And it said that the Lord accepted Abel's offering, but he did not accept Cain's offering. The heart of the issue with Cain was that he tried to come to the Lord on his own strength. He tried to come to the Lord on his own works. He tried to come to the Lord saying, this is what I am doing for you. Please be impressed. And so Cain is, is noted as the father of all religion, whereas Abel walked in grace. God said that it's going to be through the blood uh, in, in this case, the blood of an animal that will cover your sins. Therefore, receive that grace and, and obey and walk in that. And so Abel submitted to the righteousness of God and was accepted, whereas Cain said, I don't want to do a blood sacrifice. I want to show you the vegetables. I worked hard for these vegetables. I want you to accept them. And so he became the father of all religions. And as religion goes, it tends to have rules and regulations. Uh, even, even great revivals, even great denominations start out with the freedom of the spirit. But so often then man becomes involved and then that holiness movement or that denomination then becomes filled with, with layer after layer after layer of man-made laws that choke out the move of the spirit of God. And so the word is very specific about legalism, about the law. And not just religion, but this is a general principle. For instance, some of you may have been raised in a family that was very, very strict uh, with um, laws and, and rules and regulations where, uh, you know, your family was just governed strictly. It's, for instance, in my own family, uh, when we sat at the table, we had to sit perfectly straight and we could have one hand on our lap and one hand we ate. And 
usually dad was the first one to start the conversation and he would look around to we four children and ask us one by one, how was your day? And we would respond. Maybe after a while we talked and joked and a, a little bit, but dad was always in charge. And the thing about religion is there are always rules that you don't try to break, but you end up breaking them. For instance, in the Old Testament law, there are 613 laws that God gave to Moses. Some of those laws were religious laws, how to approach God, how to make sacrifices, the rules for the priests. Some of those laws were sanitary and health laws, like washing your hands and where to make the latrine outside the camp, a bathroom essentially not in, uh, not in the tent but outside the camp. And, and if a pot that had no glaze on it had something rotten in it, you could not use that pot again because you might get sick from it. Those were sanitary laws. But the biggest laws had to do with the moral laws, how we treat, how we treat one another. And in those 613 laws, they're very careful to obey them. And yet, if you remember what legalism is and religion is, it gets a person bound up so that if you are trying to obey law number 250, you accidentally break law number 121. Or in my case, let me bring it down to my case. My dad would give me orders. I want you to empty the trash. I want you to mow the grass out front. I want you to clean your room. I want you to do the dishes. And on more than one occasion, I would do maybe three out of the four, and my dad would pull me out of bed you know, at, at 2300 and, and say, you didn't empty the trash, you forgot to empty the trash. And I'm sleepy, you know, I'm a little kid and I'm out there and I'm taking the trash and emptying it from the kitchen. And no matter how hard I tried to obey all of my dad's laws, I would end up breaking one. And so I found I could never be perfect. And that is like religion in uh, many denominations, in many things that we grew up with, very strict laws. You must honor the bishop, you must honor the apostle, you must be at church every time the door is open, you must give a certain percentage and it's very much like a robot and you must do this. And if you obey w one or two or three of those, then you accidentally break one or two others. And so Paul talked about this in 2 Corinthians, well, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter three. And in verse six, he said this. He said, the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Now again, the law came by Moses, and grace and truth came by Jesus. The law has a purpose. It shows us that we are sinners. It has a purpose, but it has a point of killing us because the law tells us, defines for us, what sin is. The law shows us that we can never be perfect. In fact, when he said here in 2 Corinthians 3, 6, that the, that the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life, what that does in relationships is that if you have strict rules that you live your life by according to someone else, then they can never be perfect towards you and you can never be perfect towards you or towards them, excuse me. And so as a result, it kills the relationship. For instance, how many people have I spoken to who have been in church and they go to church and they come out worse and feeling worse than when they went in. Because when they go, all they get a sense of is what they did wrong. And so they, it, it, the, the letter gradually kills the relationship between them and the church. Uh, verse seven here, 2 Corinthians 3, seven, Paul calls it a ministry of death. And see, this is actually what happened between my father and I, is that, um, Though today he could walk into my life and we would be fine, back then, I'm talking about old history in our family, it was a ministry of death. It kills. The law kills. And as a result, when a, when a father makes legalism and like a religion with a son or with a child, anger is the result. In fact, um, verse 9 here in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 9 
says that the law is a ministry of condemnation. In other words, that child grows up thinking, I can never do anything right. And it starts killing the relationship between parent and child. And it starts, it starts causing death to happen to that relationship until finally, maybe that young man becomes a teenager and, and leaves the house. And then there are very hard feelings between he and his dad. Um, and it happens between mothers and daughters as well. So that's legalism in a home relationship. In a church relationship, legalism says, you must be baptized in our church in our way or you are not going to heaven. It says you must be here every time the door is open or else maybe God won't answer your prayers. And so people get into a performance-based faith that has nothing to do with the grace of God, has nothing to do with the fact that Christ lives in them and so they respond out of that love to live outwardly for the Lord. They are hemmed in, they are are controlled by a set of rules and regulations. Again, in the Old Testament, there were 613 of those rules and regulations. But in our own lives today, whether it be in a home that is very strict and religious-like, or not even religion, but the religion is the strictness, uh, you know, the discipline involved, or the church, the effect is the same. It kills, it's a ministry of death, and it's condemnation. And by condemnation, what that means is it's all about you. You see, when, when God convicts us, it's about Him. It's about get your heart right and get right with me. And it draws us to Him. But condemnation is all about us. Oh, I am such a horrible person. Oh, how could I ever measure up to God? I, I could never do that. Oh, I, I could never be good enough. And that sense of not being good enough is what the law brings. Paul said this in Romans chapter 3. And he's, you know, you're probably asking the same question. You know, okay, why then the law? I mean, what was the law for? If, it's a if it kills, if it's a ministry of death, if it's a ministry of condemnation, then what is the purpose? And he said in Romans chapter 3, verses 19 and 20, something that I had said earlier, responding from this. He said, uh, he said the law was given in verse 19 so that every mouth could be stopped and everyone the whole world may be found guilty before God because, in verse 20, by the law comes the knowledge of sin. So the purpose for all those rules and all those regulations was just to show Israel that you're not perfect. You need God. It's, it's a way of showing there, that there is no way to God without a Savior, that you cannot come to God like Cain building your own uh, sacrifices and your own idea of how you will approach God. And of course, all the, all the false religions of the world, all the, the, the religions of the world that come to God on their own strength, whether it be washing in a particular river or, or praying a certain number of times a day or paying X amount uh, to the church and being there every time the door is opened, every religion that is man's effort is like Cain, who came to God on his own strength. But that's not what the Lord wants. In fact, while this says that the knowledge of sin came through the law, Paul said in Galatians chapter 3 something very interesting. He said in verse uh, 21 that if it had been possible for a, one law to have been given that would have given life, then God would have issued that law. And so, in other words, he was saying, you know, there are now 613 laws you know, in the Old Testament, if there was a single law that God could have made that said this is eternal life, he would have made that. But the law was given so that people could see they were guilty. And this is where so many Christians are today. We are, con we are, we are consumed with our sin. We are consumed with how imperfect we are. We are consumed with condemnation and it has killed relationships. It has killed our relationships with our church. It has killed relationships with others because we don't have maybe 613 laws, but we Christians make our own laws in the churches and, and in the, the holiness movements and all the different things that want to force us into a mold, a, a framework that says this is what a Christian should be. Now, the law came by Moses. Praise God for it. We have just read how, how the law was there. Uh, to say that, okay, world, you are guilty before God. You're sinners. You need a Savior. Paul continues here in Galatians 3, and he says this 
in verse 24, he said the law was merely a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. And that, that, that faith would come. And verse 25 says, after faith has come, you don't need the schoolmaster anymore. Because now we've become children of God. So Paul says, you know, the law of Moses was for a particular time. It showed us how guilty we are. It showed us that we are sinners. We're not to live in that today. We have grace. Now, years ago, when I was searching this out and studying this out, I asked the Lord for that one word, what is grace? And he said this. He said, grace is a revelation of the Father or a revelation of the Father's will. And I started to see that, for instance, the most famous chapter and verse that most Christians know is John 3, 16. And I saw grace in the fact that it said that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's grace. And, but it says that all who believe in him will not perish but have eternal life. That is faith. And so I started to see that grace is a revelation of the Father and his will, that he so loved the world. That's grace. That is very different from the law, which only showed us that we are sinners, that we are no good, that we need a savior. Oh my. I, I wrote down a scripture. I wrote down a scripture, 1 uh, Timothy 1.9. And it's a great little scripture, and it says this, the law is not made for a righteous man. The law is not made for a righteous man. All those rules and regulations, if you are in Christ, Christ is in you, you're born again. Paul said, 1 Timothy 1, 9, the law is not made for you. The law is not made for a righteous person. The law is made for the sinners. It's to show them that they are sin, that they are sinners, excuse me. Hallelujah. So, once we come to Christ, we don't need the law anymore. Now, how many of us have grown up in that sort of environment where you try to obey, you know, mom and dad's rule number 20 and you break rule number four? What is it to, to, care, to have that and then carry that into Christ? What if a person is born again? They come to the Lord. They are saved. They are spirit-filled. They are walking with God, but in their minds... They transfer their upbringing or they transfer their religious training to their now new freedom in Christ. Then you have a Christian who is frustrated. Then you have a Christian who is searching for formulas because they, tr they think that the Lord has a bunch of rules and regulations that they need to all obey. And maybe someday, if they mature enough, if they arrive, they will be able to obey all 613 of God's laws and not break a single one, and they will have arrived. They will become the mature Christian they want to be. But that is such frustration, and that's why the law kills, and it's a ministry of condemnation. And, and it actually, in Romans chapter 4, uh, Paul says, I think it's in verse 14, says that the law works wrath. It works anger. And the law does work anger because you have this standard, and it's impossible for you to, to step up into that and to obey that. You can't, can never become the standard that the law presents because the law presents perfection. And so much of the time growing up, I hear men and women, even in my own life as a teenager, thinking, just tell me one thing I can do that will please you. Tell me one thing that I could do that will make you happy. And that's the way, that's why Paul was saying that in Galatians chapter 3. He said, if God could have given one law that would have brought salvation, he would have done it. But it was impossible until Christ came. And then once we obey Christ and we believe in Christ, we're new creations. And now we, we have the ability of God to walk with God. So what do we do? We transfer our mind from the religion and we carry that over and Christians end up looking for formulas. They're looking for things that they think God wants. For instance, oh, there's different movements and different fads and people think, let's take of a few years ago, there was prophecy. And the big thing was to prophesy over people. You say, okay, sit down here and let's pray for you and let's, let's have a prophecy and see what God says. And many people thought they were prophets just because they were used in prophecy. But prophecy is just one of the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's just one of the gifts of the Spirit. But people are finding their identity in that movement because they have thought this is what God wants, a performance-based faith. 
for instance, and, and then maybe it's the card-carrying apostle and prophet. You pull their card out of their wallet, I'm apostle so-and-so, and I'm bishop so-and-so. Because they are still thinking like legalism, that God wants very strict, very strict rules and regulations. And so you have people doing things like, oh, I need to go to church on Wednesday night at that service because I have an extra special prayer I need answered this week. And so if I go Wednesday night, I am showing God how sincere I am and how urgent my prayer request is. And so then I will go. And then, but what happens if you don't go Wednesday night? You feel horrible. Oh no, maybe God won't answer my prayer now because I did not go to that extra church service. See, you're living under the law. You're living under the legalism. You're living under condemnation because of the, that thinking. You've transferred this legalism into your new life in Christ, and it should not be. The law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus. And the wonderful thing about the Lord Jesus is that he said in John 14, 9 and 10, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father. So to walk with Christ means to walk in the freedom of relationship. Let me give you for instance, if I could go back in history to Abraham, the father of the faith, the one man in the Old Testament who's called the friend of God. Now Jesus calls us his disciples friends, but in the Old Testament, Abraham was the only one called the friend of God. All around Abraham, people were making sacrifices to the gods. If they wanted a successful uh, season for their livestock, their, their sheep, their goats, then they would make a sacrifice to the god of the sheep or the god of the goats. Or if they were planting their, their barley or their rye and you know, they, they wanted a successful crop, they would uh, make a sacrifice to the god of the barley or the god of the rye. But when Abraham started walking with God in a relationship, it made all sacrifices obsolete because God cannot be manipulated. He's not a little God that can be manipulated by sacrifices and, and, and extra efforts. He is God Almighty and He has now desired to walk with us. So you can't manipulate Him by making some sort of a sacrifice and think that's going to move Him. So what do we do? We have to take responsibility. We have to, we have to walk with Him. Oh, it would be so easy sometimes just to say, oh, Lord, if I could just give X amount of money and therefore I will be healed, or I could give X amount of money and therefore my children will be saved. And that would be so nice, wouldn't it? If it could be a works-based, law-based life. No, it wouldn't be because that's laziness. You know, that is legalism. Have you ever thought like that? Oh, Lord, if I could just give, oh, and I hate to say this, but there are some preachers out there who will say, you give, you know, 100 euros or you give something to my ministry, then you're going to be healed. That's that legalism, folks. If I do this, God does that. How horrible would it be if my children came in to the kitchen at the time of the evening meal and said, oh, Father, great Father John, <laughs> I have cleaned my room today and I have emptied the trash. May I now please be allowed to eat at the table? I go, what are you saying, son? You're my son. I don't care whether you've emptied the trash and cleaned your room or not. You are my child. You can do that stuff later. You are my child. Come and eat from the meal that I've prepared and that your, your mother and I have prepared. And yet we treat God like that. Oh, great God, would you please heal me? If I give you $100, will you do it? If I can prophesy over people, will, am I just that much more closer to perfection? <laughs> oh, so, you know, religion is just, again, man's efforts to approach God on man's own terms. So you can judge this in yourself. Have you ever lived a life, maybe even with a parent, maybe even with a, uh, a church, uh, and certainly personally, you can judge yourself. Have you ever done things for the Lord or in the Lord on your own effort, on your own terms? Have you tried to approach God in your own strength like Cain did? And you say, yes, but that's all I knew. Well, that's the point. In this next session, in this next installment, I'm going to teach about the revelation of grace. That grace is a revelation of the Father. And the whole of the New Testament, folks, is about Christ in us, the hope of glory. There's nothing in the New Testament that talks about we have to obey all 613 laws. In fact, what Paul said in the book of Romans, 
was that in verse in chapter 13 and verse 10 he said love works no ill towards his neighbor therefore love fulfills the law you see the one thing that the Lord could do not a law but the one thing he could do to help us walk in those 613 laws uh, are, is to, to make us new, to make us new in Christ, to put Christ in us, put His Spirit within us. And then our nature has changed. Because see, the thing about the law is this. You know, if you tell a child, don't touch this, it's hot, you know what that child's gonna do? Gonna reach out and try to touch it. Because you said not to. If you say, there's some ice cream in the freezer, don't eat it, I'll be back in 30 minutes, you come home 30 minutes later, and you know what happens? Some of that ice cream is gone. And that's the way living by law is. It actually, Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and about verse 56 or, or so, I need to turn there. He said in verse 56, that, that sin is strengthened by the law. So if you lived in a legalistic relationship with God, and certainly if you lived in a legalistic relationship with uh, your family or your church, about the time the church or your family said, do not do this, then that was the very thing that you ended up doing. Have you ever noticed that? Have you, at least in, the, in, in America and in many nations, if you preach against unwed mothers or un, uh, protected sex or something like that, you get the most unwed mothers. If you preach against alcoholism and alcohol and things like that, it's like you get the most drunk teenagers. And you look at these churches and you think, oh wait, what are they doing? They're preaching the law. What we should be doing, folks, is be focused on Christ in us, the hope of glory. Because when we are a new creation in Christ, we no longer are under the schoolmaster. We have, we have seen the tutor. We have seen the schoolmaster. We have seen that we are sinners. We get it. We understand that. But when you come to Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says you become a new creation and all things are, are made new. We're like Abraham. We don't make sacrifices to the gods anymore. We don't have to do that. We walk with God. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask for revelation as we continue in this next installment to share how, how grace is a revelation of you and your will. And so show this and cause it to resonate within us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.